I will focus on uh, a subtopic, I would say, or a related topic, uh, which is opening up scientific information in Horizon 2020, and specifically on the open research data pilot in Horizon 2020. So I work for DG Connect, uh, was already said. So that is the part of the commission that implements what Nelly Cruz says on a political level. So what she said yesterday morning, we do. That's kind of where I am within the European Commission. And I have to say it's extremely inspirational to have her um, as the person giving us those instructions because it's, it's really fun to implement what she says. So, and her vision, you heard it yesterday, uh, is very clear. So this is now the broader policy picture of, of my focus today. It is um, open digital science. That is her vision. Uh, that's the connection with Science 2.0. That's why, that's why I'm here today to present. And um, I have to say also that it's, it's also on a personal level, it's, it's very satisfying for me to be here to present today because I, um, I started working um, on this broader area in 2006 on open access to publications. That's how we began. And then um, we understood fairly quickly that the next frontier would be uh, open research data. It took a while to actually work on that. Um, I would say we started really thinking about it when we started thinking about Horizon 2020, because you start years before, actually, the Fermi program starts. You have to start thinking about what to do. So, I would say 2010, 2011, something like that. And then in 2013, so last year, end of last year, we adopted um, the pilot that I'll talk about. And then now, this year, I see a new frontier, which is open digital science. So it's, it's really fun to be here for that reason. I see a new policy process uh, starting. And um, so let me just show you a very much work in process slide or a slide that will assemble as I speak. So here are the elements that we kind of see within open digital science. And we've talked about all these already, so it's kind of putting them together. So new research methods and ways of evaluating research, open research collaborations and the e-infrastructures e needed for those, citizen engagement, citizen science, crowdsourcing, and then opening up research results, scientific publications and data, which is what I'll be focusing on now. What's the point in all this? Why is it important? For one, we think that one of the effects is more efficient science. So through shared resources, of course, science becomes more efficient. Better science. If you have all this information, you can do science in a more transparent way. New science, uh, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, and um, new research topics like societal challenges to be addressed. And then perhaps the most important um, effect from a research funder perspective is the higher impact science. So the ability to actually address societal challenges and um, economic development. And all that, again, is um, open digital science, so the ICT-enabled transformation of science. Now I'll switch uh, gears, or I'll switch back to scientific information specifically. So why, why to open it up? The, the overall goal is to optimize the impact of publicly funded uh, research uh, and innovation. And the expected impacts, of course, now link back to, to what I just said about open digital science. So we, we expect that opening up scientific information will lead to better science, more efficient science, economic growth through open innovation, and improved transparency. How do we do that? There are always traditionally two ways. First of all, we lead by example. We try to practice what we preach. Within the, with the instruments we have, so our funding program. We set up rules in the framework program, the one now is called Horizon 2020, and see how that goes. And then the other um, 
way we work is with member states. So we try to see what they do, try to bring them together to discuss and to encourage coordination. There's been a whole political process behind this. So when we were talking about starting a new policy process for um, open digital science, uh, there's been a very uh, relatively long one for um, leading to opening up scientific information. And the, um, the most important package to mention is the scientific information package of 2012. So th that was com combined of a communication where we said what we would do and a recommendation to the member states where we said, please do the same thing more or less as we do. And all that is, of course, work in progress. What scientific information uh, am I talking about? Not a big mystery. On the one hand, scientific publications. On the other, research data. So for scientific publications, of course, there's the whole debate on what kind of open access, green and gold, but I don't need to go into that. And, for, and then there's uh, open research data. And we are trying to have a, we're trying to develop a working definition of what it means to have, to open up research data. And what we have for now, again, work in progress, is data that can be accessed, mined, exploited, reproduced, and disseminated, free of charge for any user. Now, in preparing this talk, I also realized actually the two these two types of scientific information are increasingly blurred. So actually, scientific publications are data. You can, you can mine text, so publications are data. And of course, underlying publications, you have underlying research data. So again, uh, publication is no longer what it was. It's been said a number of times during this conference. And research data, too. Research data can be published. So they're data publications. So perhaps in, a, in the near future, it won't make sense anymore to really distinguish publications and research data. Now, the real focus of my talk, opening up scientific information in Horizon 2020. That's the current uh, research funding program. Of course, we didn't start from zero. We, we've already been experimenting with these kinds of topics in the previous framework program, the seventh framework program. And what we did there is focus on open access to publications. We requested open access to the publications resulting from FP7 projects in a number of areas on a best effort basis. This means we were fairly um, soft about it. We, there was no enforcement. It was kind of to see, see how it went. And uh, people ask us, so how is it going, or how did it go? First of all, it's still going, because the last uh, FP7 projects have only just started. We have the, the implementation of one framework program runs more or less into the middle of the next one. So we're not done with this pilot. But more or less the message we hear is researchers think open access is good. It's the right thing to do, but they really need more support. <laughs> they need more help, they need more tools, they need more people to explain how to do it. So that's kind of the main message for now, but open access is, is here to stay. Uh, we supported gold open access through various mechanisms, and we developed an e-infrastructure, which probably many of you know, called Open Air. It's an EU-funded portal that um, gives access to, through which you can access publications, you can deposit publications, and it's also um, a network of help desks in all the member states. So that's what we did in FP7. And now I'm moving finally to Horizon, first of all on publications. So we moved from a situation of a pilot to a mandate. Now in Horizon 2020, for all actions, action is the new word for project, by the way, uh, each beneficiary must ensure open access to all peer-reviewed scientific publications relating to its results. Um, they have to deposit their publication and then they have to ensure open access to it. What's, in, what's very interesting now from a data perspective is a, a novelty that we're also asking um, beneficiaries to deposit the underlying data linked to the publications when they deposit their publications, okay? So we say it's no longer enough to just put the publications there. We need the stuff underneath with which we can validate what's in the publication. 
And we also are trying to go a step further with metadata. We also need the metadata and open access to it. So these two elements are, I would say, a, a realization that the publication is no longer what it was and um, trying to push further on what the publication of the future should become. Some more details on publications. So we support uh, um, green and gold open access. We ask for deposit into a repository always, even if um, it's gold open access, because we would like everything to be accessible in an open manner, for example, for mining purposes. We continue to support um, open access publishing, so um, gold open access through various mechanisms. And in terms of licensing, we encourage authors to retain their copyright and to grant publishers licenses instead of signing over their copyright. <laughs> Open research data. We liked the idea of doing a pilot on publications. It worked so well that we thought, let's do the same for data. And um, there are a series of questions that we um, asked ourselves, and I hope they turned out to be the right ones, we'll see. So first of all, and I'll go through these now, what's the scope of the pilot? When can actions opt out of the pilot? What data is actually covered? What about data management? And what are the obligations in the pilot? So the first question, what is the scope of the pilot? Where, where does it apply? You have on this slide the, the areas, so future and emerging technologies, research infrastructures, the e-infrastructures part, light ICT, then we have a series of uh, societal challenges. We have secure, clean and efficient energy, but only the part on smart cities. And then we have the whole societal challenge on climate action except raw materials. Then we have a whole societal challenge, Europe in a changing world, which is essentially a social sciences and humanities, and then science within for society. Um, I was asked uh, yesterday during the break um, why, <laughs> and why these areas? Well, like everything else, this was a re result of a political uh, negotiation. But I can say that um, our commissioner, Nelly Cruz, really wanted all her parts to be in there. She said, I want to put all my money in there. So we have FET, e-infrastructures, and light ICT is all in there. Although one could argue that light ICT, well, that might be a bit problematic. I'll come to that now on the opt-out. But she wanted it all in there. The red sentence underneath is also very important. Everyone who's not included can be included. So if you're not in, you can still participate on a voluntary basis. That's the wording we use. And that's, that's also very important. And it, it's encouraging to see that we actually already have requests internally and externally. People calling us and saying, oh, what is this and how can we participate? So that's uh, encouraging. Now, opting out of the pilot. This audience might ask, well, why? why? But I, this was actually a big part of the run-up to um, adopting this pilot. Um, you know, we had basically stakeholders coming to us and saying, oh, but this is, could be very dangerous to open up all data, all kinds of things that could happen, especially from industry, I have to say, but not only. So what we did is draw up a series of situations in which actions can opt out of the pilot. And you see them listed here. And this is actually at submission stage. So at the moment where um, proposers submit their proposals. So one, the first one is the, is the unproblematic one. So if projects don't generate data, that's, that's OK. Next one, in case of conflict with the obligation to protect results. As, as you may know, in Horizon 2020, there's actually an obligation to exploit anything that comes out of your research commercially if you can. So if there's a conflict with that, you can opt out. Then, in case of conflict with confidentiality obligations, then in case of conflict with security obligations in the national security sense, 
In case of conflict with rules on protection of personal data, that's also quite a broad one. And then finally, if the achievement of the action's main objective would be jeopardized by making specific parts of the research data openly accessible. You have to read that pretty much also in an exploitation commercialization context. So if, if the, if it's open of course, but that's kind of the idea that's behind it. If the objective of my project is to produce a product and if opening up data would jeopardize that well, then I can opt out. What type of data are we talking about? We have quite a, well, in the end, a quite an easy, a simple distinction. The first kind of data that is covered is um, the underlying data that I already mentioned. So the data connected with publications. On this, there's a general feeling uh, internally, externally from stakeholders that this is not really a problem because this data should be available in order to be able to verify um, what's written in the publication. The second category is a very broad category, which we call other data, including the, the metadata, as specified in a data management plan, the DMP. Why did we keep it so vague and so broad? Essentially because we trust the researcher. We realize that it's completely impossible for a program of this range. We cover all sorts of disciplines. It's impossible for us to say that kind of data um, should be open and shouldn't. So what the approach is to ask for a data management plan and that researchers, projects, will be able to define exactly First of all, what kind of, well, I'll come to that now, but what should be open and what not. So it's basically a trust in the researcher um, kind of approach. So what about data management? That's details on that now. Um, this is broader, actually, than open access and open data. It's a new focus on data management in Horizon 2020. Of course, there's always been data management, and um, certain researchers realize the importance of it, but we also know that others didn't. So now all proposers will have to submit general information on data management. I'm not talking about the data management plan. I'm talking about a few sentences or paragraphs in general on how data will be managed. And that will actually be evaluated under one of the criteria. On the other hand, for uh, projects, for actions participating in the pilot, a data management plan will be mandatory uh, within the first six months uh, after the project. And that's where these questions will be treated. Other projects can also submit a DMP if it's relevant for their research. They're not obliged, but it's something that we intend to push as a general, uh, general campaign to push data management as really actually the only way you can do uh, research. Good research is research that thinks about data management. So the, the questions raised in the DMP, and we have a template on that, are the following. There are sub-questions, but these are the broad categories. What data will be collected or generated? What standards will be used? And how will metadata be generated? What data will be exploited? what data will be shared and made open, and how will the data be curated and preserved? Not reserved, preserved. Okay, now, that was all nice, and now, but what do people have to do with that data? So what does it mean to be in the pilot? What are the obligations linked to the pilot? Beneficiaries have to, first of all, deposit the kinds of data that we discussed. So they have to deposit underlying data and other data in a research data repository of their choice. It's kept broad like that intentionally because, again, we trust the researcher. The researcher knows where the data should go. That's our approach. But we are developing uh, tools to help. And actually, we already have um, projects that are doing that. So Open Air is working on, on it, EU DAT, which was mentioned. There's a series of, of actions already being, being undertaken to ensure that, that there's help there to, to decide what kind of repository to choose. 
So that's the first obligation, deposit. That's not linked yet to making open. Then obligation two is linked to opening up. So here we come to our definition of open research data. Take measures to make it possible to access, mine, exploit, reproduce, and disseminate free of charge. For example, using Creative Commons license. Now notice the words take measures to. That's a new way of saying best effort. That's a new legal phrasing to say, please try very hard, and if you can't do it, we'll take that as a lesson. And we also ask that um, information be provided about the tools and instruments necessary to actually read and reuse the data. Because of course, with data, it's, it's different than with publications. The point is not reading it, the point is reusing it. So we realize that data needs that kind of information around it to be useful. So we ask for information about, and if, necess if possible, the actual tools themselves. Something else important, um, if you're in the pilot, you still don't have to make all your data open again. So in your DMP, you will describe what you can make open and what not, and why. And so this is a second place where you could not opt out of the pilot, but where you can uh, take out certain data sets if there are good reasons for that. And for, for all the same reasons that I went through for the, for the opt-out. Okay, and this is kind of my, uh, my, um, my plea. <laughs> the open research data pilot, it's a pilot, first of all. And it's a real chance to co-shape policy in this area. It's the new frontier. We recognize it. We have an ambitious yet also pragmatic approach in the pilot. There's a broad scope, but you can opt out, and voluntary participation is possible. So it's kind of, you know, pick and choose. Everything is kind of possible. Pilot is flexible. Numerous safeguards are in place. And we're going to, of course, monitor all this. We're going to see what the uptake is, who's, who's in and who's out, and for what reasons. And we really, really need all the input we can get on this. And we're, so, again, participating in the pilot means co-shaping European policy on opening up research data for the next framework program. And you can be sure we'll start on that pretty early. So be part of it, is the message. And yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. So thank you for your kind presentation, Selina Ramjusi. We have time for some questions. Yes. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I have a question. Do you recommend some um, repositories? Um, for um, you said the um, um, scientists can choose a repository of um, they are, um, can choose the repository to store the data, but perhaps they need some recommendations or some yes uh, something like rules to know okay this is a very sure a very good um, repository or this is perhaps not so good. Yes, so that's, that's an important question. Actually, the last slide is useful in that respect. Uh, you see the guidelines on open access to scientific publications and research data in the middle. In, in this document, we haven't yet provided much guidance on that question, but there is some. So we list a few, uh, I would say, general data repositories. And these guidelines will actually be updated at some point, I think fairly soon, and to include an annex an annex which will have a, a, a longer list. But again, we don't want to be prescriptive at all. This is, it's, it's similar to um, publications. We, we really don't want to prescribe. But yes, we will provide more guidance. Yes. More questions? 
on commands. Yes, over there, to this one. Yeah, I have questions more, I think, from a policy perspective rather than from a researcher's uh, perspective. If I decide to opt out of this uh, pilot, is that at all going to be taken into account in the evaluation of my proposal? And also, if I decide to opt out, is this something that is going to be second guess? So is it possible that I say, well, one of these reasons actually apply? Uh, is then is there someone who at the commission looks at this and says, well, may, may, you know, I think that's wrong. I think you might not have a reason to opt out and therefore maybe your proposal um, is, is out just for that reason. I just would like to know a little bit more about the mechanism. Mm -hmm. And then I think maybe one word that also uh, might not be you know, very popular in this uh, group, but I think something that I always feel needs to be taken into account is that in the end, you know, this is not the commissioner's money, this is European taxpayers' money. And so, of course, there's always an interest uh, to keep in mind that we are doing this at a policy level, also for Europe's competitiveness. And when we think about competition on a global level, I always wonder if there are programs in the US or in Asia that are comparable, or actually publicly funded uh, programs would allow European researchers to have this much access to data that can then be used. Um, so these are just... Okay, I'll take it from the beginning. So the first question is, uh, is it negative uh, or positive in your evaluation if you participate or don't participate? The answer is no. It's written in the guidelines too, it, has, it bears no it, that it's specifically mentioned because many people have uh, this worry. So, no, it has absolutely no link. Um, and then the other question was on the second guessing. So, can it happen that the Commission um, looks at the opt-out and says, well, no, but I don't agree with that? I would say, in principle, no. However, um, there will be a short negotiation phase in Horizon 2020. Mm -hmm. And that is a moment when uh, I think any project officer has the possibility of having a, you know, doing a sanity check and seeing, well, you know, if something doesn't make sense at all, I mean, I, I wouldn't completely exclude the possibility. But it's certainly not, there certainly won't be systematically looking at this and trying to change what the researcher, the project, uh, itself has determined. Now, the, the third question was on um, pr similar programs in uh, globally. Um, okay, I mean, here, for me, I mean, science is, is not, um, there are no boundaries. So if, if what we fund, if we require, if we request or re recommend openness for what comes out of what we fund, um, anyone can access it, uh, be they Europeans, Asians, uh, Americans, it makes no difference. So I, I don't think that there are any boundaries applying to international programs. And I know that, for instance, NIH, NSF, these kinds of institutions have very strong uh, policies in this direction, also on data management. So I would say it's a, it's a global movement, and I don't see how you can actually have any any boundaries according to continent. Okay, um, Selina. Um, so you, you mentioned open access, and uh, but you didn't talk much about the different licenses which do exist. Um, so do you also require the projects to apply a certain license, like for example CC0, you know, Creative Commons, share alike, non-commercial, buy, all that might be important for those, you know, publishing the data. Yes, we didn't, um, we didn't make any, well, there are no legal requirements, first of all, and not even very specific recommendations, I have to say. We made specific rec recommendations for publications, for open access to publications, but not for data. Uh, but we did, we did mention Creative Commons licenses. We said, e.g., Creative Commons. 
and uh, you know, CC zero, CC by would be the ones we have in mind. But we didn't, we weren't more specific on that. More questions or comments? Yeah, in the back. Um, yes, hi, my name is Sascha Frieseke. Um, I have one question that is why you choose to have this opt-out model rather than an incentive for sharing. Um, if I read correctly, you have one case that says, if the achievement of the action's main objective would be jeopardized by making specific parts of the research data openly accessible. That to me sounds like a catch-all. Like any researcher I know that can come up with something that could fall in that category. So if they don't want to, they won't. Um, which means to me, like, why don't you give an extra incentive, like, for instance, more money to the researcher or have a quota, like only projects, like only 40% of all projects are allowed not to share and once that's full, the other ones have to, or some, like, or some other incentive to share. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, ultimately we are, you know, the approach is incentive-based and I, I believe that that's, that's the most, that's the strongest approach. Uh, I can only repeat what I said, uh, I think, right before I went through those, those opt-out options. This is very much the result of a, a political discussion with stakeholders and then also internally. And this was deemed to be a, a good approach to take in a pilot, also to really see what happens. Do people opt out and what reasons do they indicate? Um, uh, about the catch-all phrase, I mean, I don't think it's more catch-all than any of the others listed. And again, we'll have to see, we'll have to see the uptake. We'll have to see how many people tick that, and and we'll have to interpret that. Thanks.